All right, what's up, what's up, y'all? Back at it once again, continue on, on the church commission. And um, talking about this right here in the church commission book too. And this one is, a, you know, a topic you gotta really pay attention to, you know what I'm saying? This one is about the FBI informants, all right? You know what I'm saying? How they did it. FBI informants, B. There's only gonna be about six pages, you know what I'm saying? I'm gonna show a couple of something else and this is gonna be, you know, short kind of video on the, on the subject. The FBI manual has never seen, this come from the church commissions, you know, so you get this intelligence.gov, this is from the government website I'm getting it from. So it's not made up monkey stuff.com, you know what I'm saying? Gotta give a shout out to my ancestors, you know, and I um, gotta give a shout out to you, the subscriber, for, you know, watching, you know, and paying attention. I hope y'all learned something, you know, because I learned a lot on this too. FBI informants. The FBI manual has never significantly limited informant reporting about the unlawful activities or a personal life of American citizens, except for prohibiting reports about legal defense plans or strategy, which they broke before. Just look up um, Ronald Moplat. Employer-employee relationships connected with labor unions and legitimate captain's activity. In practice, FBI agents pose no other limitations on informants they handle, and on occasions, disregard the prohibitions from the manual. Number one, infiltration of the Klan. In mid-1964, mid in mid the Justice Department officials became increasingly concerned about the spread of the Ku Klux Klan activity and violence in the Deep South. General Attorney Kennedy advised President Johnson that because of the uniquely difficult presentation, pres presence and it's about a situation where lawless activities has sanctioned a law enforcement agencies. The FBI should apply to the Klan the same techniques used previously in the infiltration of the communist groups. Former Attorney General Kattenbach, who's under ten, who's, under whose tenure the FBI activities against the Klan expanded, vigorously defended this decision as a necessary to deter violence by sowing deep mistrust among Klan members and making them aware that they are under constant observation. The FBI manual did, in fact, advise the Bureau of Agents against wholesale investigations of persons who merely attended meetings on a regular basis. But FBI intelligence officials chafed under this restriction and saw it expanded informant coverage. Subsequently, the manual was revised in 1967 to require the field to furnish the details of Klan rallies and demonstrations. By 1971, special agents in charge of field officers had discretionary to investigate not only persons with potential for violence, but also anyone else in the SAC judgment was an extremist. Number two, listening posts in the black community. And this is very important. Got to pay attention. Listening posts in the black community. Two special informant programs illustrate the breadth of the Bureau's infiltration of the black community. All right, two special informant programs illustrate the breadth of the Bureau's infiltration of the black community. In 1970, the FBI used established informants to determine the background, aims, and purposes, leaders, and key activists in every black student group in the country, regardless of the group's past or present involvement in this in this orders. So it don't even matter. Like I said before, you know, you didn't have, any, if you was a black group and it had nothing to do with it, you know what I'm saying? They still had you on file just because, you know, you're black. Field officers were instructed to target informants against these groups and develop such a coverage where informants were not already available. In response, Attorney General Clark instructions regarding to civil disorders intelligence in 1967, the Bureau of Arts, a ghetto informant program which lasted until 1973, supposedly. The number of ghetto informants expanded rapidly to 4,067 in 1969 to 7,402 in 1972. The original concept was to establish listening posts by recruiting a person who lives or works in a ghetto area to provide information regarding the racial situation or racial activities. Such informants can include a proprietor of a candy store or a barber shop. As the program developed, which is kind of slick, you know, you think about this. Let me say a side note, especially the barber shop, because where everybody in the black community knew that. 
you know, a lot of black, you know, a lot of shit go down at the barbershop. If you know a lot of gossip, a lot of bullshit, you know what I'm saying? So that was that was, you know, they already knew. So they went straight to the barbershop or the candy store. As the program developed, however, ghetto informers were utilized to attend public meetings held by streamers and to identify extremists passing through or locating in the ghetto area, to identify purveyors of extremist literature, as well as giving special specific assignments where appropriate. Hmm. Extremist literature. Material was to be furnished by general informants, including the name of Afro-American type bookstores. Mm. So now you wonder why now you understand why there's no bookstores in the black community. You know what I'm saying? Materials be furnished by general including underlying bookstores and their owners and operators and clientele. So one, so, uh, so somebody put a black gist, uh, a bookstore in a black community, the feds is instantly going to jump on that and knock it. You know what I'm saying? They don't want no new information being passed around like that. Infiltration of the new left. The FBI uses security informant program to report extensively on all activities related to opposition to the Vietnam War. Moreover, informants were already in groups considered subversive by the FBI, also reported on the activities of other organizations and their members, if the latter were being infiltrated by former groups. The agent who handled one informant in an anti-war group believed that to be infiltrated by subversive groups or violent elements, testified that the informant told him everything she knew about the chapter she joined. Summaries of her report indicate that she reported extensively about the personal matters and the lawful political activities. This informant estimated her report identified as many 1,000 people to the FBI over an 18-month period. The vast majority of these persons were members of a peaceful and law-abiding group, including the United Church for Christ were engaged in joint social welfare projects with anti-war groups which the informant had infiltrated. Other FBI informants reported, for example, on the Women's Liberation Movement, identifying its members at several Midwestern universities and reporting statements by, made by women concerning their personal reasons for participating in the women's movement. Moreover, as in the case of informants in the black community, Efforts were made greatly to increase the number of informants who could report on the anti-war and related groups. In 1969, the Justice Department specifically asked the FBI not only to make an existing source, but also any sources, sources that you may have may be able to develop to collect information about serious campaign dis, serious campus disorders. The Bureau ordered its field office in 1970 to make every effort to attain informant coverage of every new left commune. Later that year, Director Hoover lifted re restrictions against recruiting 18 and 20 year olds, 21 year old informants. Bill houses, bill offices were urged to take advantage of this tremendous opportunity to expand their coverage of the new left collective communes and staff on the underground newspapers. Mm. So they definitely come after the literature. C. Army surveillance of civilian political activity. In the early 1960s, at the Seventh Commitment of Troops to Control Racial Disturbances and the Enforced Court Orders in the South, Army intelligence began collecting information on civilians and political activities in all areas where it believed civil disorder might occur. The growth of the Army's domestic intelligence program simplifies once again the general tendency of information gathering operations to continue their broadening of their coverage. Shortly after, the Army was calling the quell the civil disorders in Detroit in the cope with the anti-war demonstration at the Pentagon in 1967. The Army Chief of Staff approved a recommendation for a continuous counterintelligence investigation to obtain information on subversive personalities, groups, and organizations and their influence on urban populations and promoting civil disturbances. The Army's collection plan for civil disturbances specifically targeted as dissenting elements without further definition, the Civil Rights Movement, all right? The Army's collection plan for civil disturbances specifically targeted as dissident elements without further definition, the Civil Rights Movement and the anti-Vietnam, anti-draft movement. As revised later, the Army intelligence gathering extended to beyond subversion and dissident groups to prominent persons who were friendly with the leaders of disturbance or sympathetic with their plans. D. Federal encouragement of local police intelligence. In a reaction to the civil disorders in 1965 and 1966, 
Attorney General Kahnbach turned his advice to the newly, the newly created Presidential Commission on Law Enforcement and Administration of Justice. After holding a conference with the police and National Guard officials, the President Commission urged the police not to react too much force to disorder in the course of demonstrations, but to make an advanced plans for a true riot situation. This meant that the police should establish procedures for an acquisition and challenging for and channeling of intelligence for the use of those that need it. Former Assistant Attorney General Vincent recalled that the Justice Department concerned that local police did not have any useful intelligence or knowledge about the ghettos, about the black communities in the big city. Mm. Right? Let me read that again. Former Assistant Attorney General Vincent recalled the Justice Department concerned that local police did not have any, any useful intelligence or knowledge about the ghettos, about the black communities in the big city. During the winter of 1967 and 1968, the Justice Department and the National Advisory Committee on Civil Disorders reiterated the message that the local police should establish intelligence unit to gather and disseminate information on potential civil disorders. These units were used to un uncover police personnel and informants and draw on community leaders, agencies, and organizations in the ghetto. Let me read this one more time. During the winter of 18, 1967 and 1968, the Justice Department and the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders reiterated the message that local police should establish intelligence units to gather and disseminate information on potential, potentials in quotations, civil disorders. These units will use undercover police personnel and informants and draw on the leaders, community leaders, agencies, and community and organizations in the ghetto. Right, so the ghetto community leaders in the black community is dropping rocks on you. They show right here that control them, you know what I'm saying? They control the agencies and some of the organization. The commission urged, also urged that these yoke lunatics be linked to a national center and clearinghouse in the Justice Department. So your leader, your black leader, you know what I'm saying, has to go through a national clearinghouse to before they name that mother leader your community. Think about that. Your black leader has to go through a clearinghouse in a national center in the Justice Department before they deem this cat a black leader. It's all up in here in the government documents. One consequence of these recommendations was that the FBI, because of a regular liaison with the local police, became a channel and a respiratory for much of this intelligence data. Local police intelligence was provided a convenient matter for the FBI to acquire information it wanted while avoiding criticism of using covert techniques such as developing campus informants. For example, in 1969, Director Hoover decided that additional student informants cannot be developed by the Bureau. Field officers were instructed, however, that, that the one way to continue attaining intelligence on situations of having potential for violence was to develop an in-depth liaison with local law enforcement agencies. Instead of recruiting student informants itself, the FBI will rely on the local police to do so. These federal policies contribute to the proliferation of the local police intelligence activities and often without adequate control. One result was that still more persons were subject to, be, to investigation who neither engaged in unlawful activity nor belong to groups who might be violent. For example, a recent state grand jury report on the Chicago Police Department security section described it as a close working relationship with the federal intelligence agencies, including Army Intelligence and the FBI. The report found that the police intelligence system produced an inherently inaccurate and distorted data, which contaminated federal intelligence. One police officer testified that he listed any person who attended two public meetings as a member of the group. This conclusion was forwarded as a fact to the FBI. Subsequently, the agent seeking background information on that person from the Bureau had, had in an employment investigation or for other purposes will be told the individuals a member, the grand jury stated. So let me just sign out again. So the Chicago Police Department security section has a working relationship with the FBI and Army Intelligence. And a lot of other federal agencies. And they ain't the only security department. I know New York, the police department definitely has one. The grand jury stated, since federal agencies accept data from security sections without question, the procedures followed 
or the method used to gain information, the federal government cannot escape responsibility for the harm done to untold numbers of innocent persons. Mm. So they know they was whacking them out the gang. You know what I'm saying? That's bad. They know they was whacking out the gang. E, Justice Department Intersection to Information Unit. All right, Interdivision Information Unit, IDUIU. Joseph Calafino, President Johnson's assistant in 1967, testified that the New York, the New York, and the Detroit riots were a shattering experience for the Justice Department officials and for us in the White House. They were concerned about the lack of intelligence about black groups. Consequently, there was a desire to have a Justice Department have better intelligence for lack of a better turn about the same groups. This desire anticipated the intelligence unit established by Attorney General Ramsey Clark in the late 19, in late 1967. According to Calafino, the president and the White House staff were insisting there must be a way to predict violence. We gotta know more of this. Hmm. In September 1967, Attorney Clark asked Assistant Attorney General John Doerr to review the department's facilities for civil disorder intelligence. Doerr recommended creating a Department of Intelligence Unit to analyze FBI information about certain persons and groups without further definition in ghetto in urban ghettos. Urban ghettos is a slang for black. He proposed that the scope be very broad initially. So they doing a the whole neighborhood. They doing the, basically the whole race. You know what I'm saying? He proposed that it's going to be very broad initially, so that's the measure influence of particular groups. Doerr recommended that in addition to FBI agencies, should funnel information to the unit should include community relations services, right? Y'all heard them before. They in your community. Look these up. Community relations services, right? Doerr recommended that the additional FBI agencies who should funnel information to the unit should include the community relations service, poverty programs, right? They're taking information from there. Checking out, you know, who they do. Neighborhood legal service programs, labor department programs, intelligent unit of the IRS, you know what I'm saying, internal revenue services, alcohol, tobacco, and firearm security, division of the Treasury Department, ATF, the Carter Bureau, you know what I'm saying, and post office. So all these places right here, these places on the name, are listening posts in the black community. Especially look up your community relations service. They're still around. You know what I'm saying? Like all these groups are basically still around. Let's get back to the story. Doerr recognized that the Justice Department community relations service designed to conciliate racial conflicts, risk losing credibility, and their rise ability to help prevent riots. But he assured the Attorney General that, this, that the confidentiality of this information could be protected. A later study well, Attorney General Clark added the, the, the following agencies to the door list. Presidential Commission of the Civil Attorney Disorders, the New Jersey Blue Ribbon Commission and similar state agencies, the State Department, Army Intelligence, the Office of Economic Opportunity, right? The Office of Economic Opportunity, we don't go a little bit more deeper than this in this video about them. They definitely still around in the black neighborhood. The Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, CIA, and national security. This study recommended that FBI reports are relating to the civil disorder deserved problems under the heading of black power, new left, pacifist, pro-red Chinese, anti-Vietnam, and anti-Castro. You know, give me a break. So that's how they got down. So all these places on the name, I'm gonna go through them one more time. because you know, it's very imperative. The Blue, the, prison, the, uh, the President's Commission of Civil Disorders, the Blue New Jersey Ribbon Commission, the similar state agencies, State Department, Army Intelligence, right? This is for the Black community, right? Army Intelligence, the Office of Economic Opportunity, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, the CIA and the NSA, right? The Community Relations Services, all poverty programs in the Black community are listening posts, you know what I'm saying? For the black community, for the FBI and the feds. Neighborhood and legal service program. They don't know how much trouble you get into. Labor department program. Intelligence union for the internal revenue services. And alcohol, tobacco, firearms, post office department, things of that nature. All right, now this right here you're looking at is the, um, the Office of Economic Opportunity. This is the Wikipedia page, Let's go through real quick, you know was an agency responsible for administering the war on poverty. Remember I said the poverty programs. 
all poverty programs, you know what I'm saying? It was listed and posted in the black community. It was created part of the United States by Lyndon B. Johnson and Great Society. Legislative agenda. Matter of fact, the whole legislative society was a military plot. You know what I'm saying? I know I know I haven't proved it that much in this video, but it, you know, it's looking like that, you know. This office was created by President Lyndon Johnson, and his first direct director was Margaret Shiver, you know, Sergeant Shiver, you know, married to Kennedy, Kennedy family. The program says it's a visa, job course, community action program, and has start. So that program was later transferred to the Department of Health and Education Welfare, was administered by the EOEE, -E, by the OEO. -E you know what I'm saying? So they started with the babies and going all the way to the adults, with the Head Start program all the way up. It was established in 1964 and came to target of left and white wing criticism on the war on poverty. Blah, 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 blah. You know what I'm saying? So that's how I was noticed. So that's how I was doing the mission of poverty and stuff like that. So just to show you that. But it later transformed. Oh, no, the, right here. Oh, no, OEO, CSA was transferred to the Office of Community Services. The Office of Community Services. We talked about that in the other one, right? Within the Department of Health Services Department by President Reagan in 1981, most of the agencies continue the program on the, on the HHS or other federal agencies. Now here go that federal agency. Now here go that federal agency, the Community Action Agency. In the United States, in this territory, the Community Action Agency, one more time. The community Action Agency were a local and private nonprofit organization that carry out community action programs, which was founded by the Economic Opportunity Act and the fighting the war on poverty, empowering the poor on part of war or poverty, right? Started to give you block grants. You guys look up that because your city get a lot of those. Community service block grants. This is the CAA Community Action Agency. Head Start programs, you know, low income energy assistance. They all doing that just keep as a listening post in the black community. Food pantries, of course, because you want to have the community eating. You understand know what I'm saying? So of course you're going to have food pantries there. There are currently a thousand CAAs engaged in broad activities. Typical activities include promoting citizen participating, providing utility and bill assistance, weather assistance for home, mobilization for low income individuals, and head start to get your baby started. In 1964, the U.S. poverty rate income based on 19% of Americans and rising political forces demand change. Under the new White House Economic Office of Economic Opportunity, we just told you that, the concept of a reality funded local CA community action program delivered by the Community Action Agency in a nationwide community action na nation network. And a nationwide community action network will become the primary vehicle of a new federal war on poverty. But this network they got is a spy network, basically. But as I said before, they use them as listening posts. If you don't believe me, just go back over the work. And it says it deep in the church commissions. So the black community is basically being inspired upon still to this day, leadership still being picked and you had to go through a clearinghouse. You know what I'm saying? Through the Justice Department clearinghouse, still to this day. You know, do this book in a in book, church commission book two and book three should you know, really be analyzed by people to understand that. You know what I'm saying? Really by all people to see how they really get down like that. You know, but People down there, you know what I'm saying? This is where the money, remember when um, Obama had to bail out, you know what I'm saying? Where did the money went to? The money went to the community action agency. They use it as a listening post. Anyway, we're gonna go a little bit more deeper into that, you know what I'm saying? Later on in, in later videos about this stuff, because I got a lot of stuff on the community action agency and things of that nature, and a lot of these programs. Anyway, I'd like to thank my ancestors and thank you for listening. You know, much love to you, you know what I'm saying? and hopefully let you learn something. Hey, peace, you have a good one. Peace.